Okay, so I'll just do a little intro and then we'll get into it, all right? Yes, sure. Uh, how's it going, everybody? And welcome to episode 116 of Master My Garden podcast. Now, this week's episode is an exciting one. So we're going to the other side of the Atlantic. And for the first time, I'm going to Canada. And I'm joined this week by Stephanie Rose, who has written uh, a new book called The Regenerative Garden. And we're going to hear all about that. Uh, I didn't realize until today that this is actually her 11th gardening book. So uh, quite an experienced gardening author and looking forward to hearing the story. Uh, the Regenerative Garden, it's a beautiful book. Um, the cover tells me 80, 80 practical projects for creating a self-sustaining garden ecosystem. So a really interesting book, lots of really interesting topics in it, um, covering things like composting, permaculture, uh, water storage, planting gills, com companion planting, all that sort of thing. So really interesting stuff in it. And as I say, excited to be going to Canada for the first time. So Stephanie, you're very, very welcome to Master My Garden podcast. Thank you so much. Hello from Canada, Vancouver, BC. Lovely. I'm on the west coast of Canada too. So as like I, I'm just as far away as possible as I can get on Canada uh, from you. <laughs> yeah, and Canada is very much on uh, myself and my wife's uh, wish list uh, as a place to visit and uh, looking forward to doing that sometime. Uh, obviously, it's a it's a beautiful country, but never been. And it's definitely on the on the on the wish list of somewhere to go. So uh, looking forward to that at some point in the future. But it's lovely to have you on. Um, I have a copy of your book here, which is really beautiful, practical book and lots of interesting things in it. And I know that the listeners will find the principles in it uh, very interesting and useful. But it's supposed to set the tone a little bit because you have 11, 11 gardening books under your belt, maybe a little bit of the backstory as to how you got into gardening and, uh, you know, how these books have evolved and th this one being the most recent, which we're going to talk about in depth. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for saying those things that the book is beautiful and practical and has a lot of um, things that you can take away because that's really what I was aiming to do was make it very accessible, um, very attractive, make people want to get, dive into these projects, but make it in a way that it's not intimidating at all. And permaculture can be that way. I mean, we call this a home spell permaculture book and it takes some of those concepts that are in those big textbooks about permaculture and break it down into a way that it's easy and accessible to everybody. And so I guess that's um, a little bit of where I started. I in back in 2006, I one day I got a headache and I was not able to get out of bed for uh, the next two years. And I became suddenly disabled overnight, had to stop everything that I was doing. I was working in a corporate job in an office. And then all of a sudden I was in bed and I was stuck at home. And it's not that different as to what happened uh, a global scale to people when we had to shut down with COVID. All of a sudden people were no longer working in their offices and now they were at home. And so back then I did what um, many people did with COVID, uh, which was go outside into my backyard and learn from my land, sort of dig in the soil a little bit, plant some seeds, see what grew. Uh, because I had a physical disability, it was um, something that limited me. I wasn't able to take on too much. So I started yeah. with just five minutes a week, scratching in the soil, uh, reading every book from the library that I could about gardening and practicing what I was learning. And through that, and I transformed uh, my, my yard, my little Vancouver urban yard went from two squares of green turf grass to beautiful, lush, thriving gardens. Uh, I joined a community garden. I became a Vancouver master gardener. I then started studying permaculture and herbalism and plant medicine, and it really just bloomed and changed everything about my life. So over those years, um, about eight years later, I was asked to, oh, I don't even know if it was eight years, maybe closer to nine years later, I was asked to write my first book. And um, as I started to you know, write a little bit about it and share some of these experiences of making gardening accessible to all fo folks of all different abilities and spaces and uh, economical situ economic situations. Uh, I found that um, I found I found this passion for sort of breaking difficult subjects down into easy pieces, bite-sized pieces. 
And, um, and that's sort of how it all bloomed. My gardens bloomed, I got healthy again. And I've just recently relapsed a little bit in my disability. It's an autoimmune disease. And so it does tend to flare up every once in a while. Okay. I was healthy for a long time. As it, as it uh, has developed now, I'm turning back to my, my garden therapy and starting to um, you know, employ some of those easier practices, again, that help me get outside and sort of rebuild my body and, and my mind at the same time as you know, sort of enjoying the sun and the soil and all those things. Yeah. There's a, a couple of things originally at the very very early stages what was it that that drew you outside for those five minutes like because given the situation you were in it could have been the tv or it could have been a book but can you specifically say what it was that drew you outside to actually start you know scratching around in the soil as you said yourself it's a you know it's it's a it's a grounding and i, I read a, a really interesting book recently called earthing i don't know if you've ever come across that Mm -mm. Um, it's a really interesting book. Um, I don't know why I read it. I, I just happened to come across it on Audible and listened to it. And there's massive amounts of scientific research about how actually touching the clay, touching the earth, um, gives you so many benefits uh, throughout your body. And they have been proven over, over a long period of time. Uh, and it was a really interesting book, but I was just wondering what, what it was that drew you out there at those very early stages. That's such a great question, John. And I think, um, you know, you might have actually answered it for me by saying that there's something that draws you out there that maybe we don't even un completely understand. I, I, I was stuck at home because, you know, my body was not able to go far and I didn't have the energy. Um, and I had this little house with this yard and there was land outside. I mean, I looked at also, I think the, the mystery of not knowing exactly what it was that was going on with my health made me look at everything that I put in my body, I put on my body. So I kind of stripped back to basics. And okay. what's quite funny, I don't know if you had the same thing we had here in North America, but everybody started baking sourdough bread early on in the pandemic. It was yeah. like sourdough bread city. And it was quite funny because I started doing that early in my disability as well. And I was, as soon as I thought everybody's doing the sourdough bread making and gardening and starting to make their own soaps and lotions, which is also what I do. Um, you know, I make all my own skincare and, you know, sort of eat from fresh from the garden or as close to um, the seed as possible. All of these things are what people turn to when they were also in a pandemic. And I, so when I saw everybody baking sourdough, I thought, oh yeah, I've done this. Like, I, I know this path, people keep going. This is great. You're gonna be, you're gonna fall in love with nature. You're gonna fall in love with garden. We're gonna get back to our roots and start yeah. making things from scratch again. I don't know. It was just so fulfilling to sort of strip away all the industrialized production and globalism and just really get back to those basics. And I think that was part of the healing, the healing process for me. Yeah, excellent. And, and like, as I said, there is reading that book or listening to that book on Audible, it was uh, like there's proven benefits of it. But then, as you said, in the pandemic, people found gardening to be because the world got so scary, I guess, and everybody got confined and it felt all a little bit claustrophobic but yet still outside, there was a little bit of surety in nature just continued to roll on as if there was nothing happening. The birds sang their songs, the flowers bloomed, and people felt peace out there that they just didn't feel with everything else that was going on. So I think that that definitely, yeah, and the sourdough, we weren't quite build, making sourdough here. We were probably making different types of bread, but it's the exact same thing. We got back to real basics and, uh, Hopefully, a lot of that remains now that we start to touch wood and move forward out of, out of COVID. Um, the book itself, maybe, or, or maybe the stage is on from there. So you started and you said yourself, it was literally just a little bit of scratching around and you started researching. But what I have now in this book is a, a really, you know, a broad uh, spectrum of knowledge condensed down in a really nice way and an easy way. So maybe tell us about the journey between the original scratching around to obviously the master gardener that you are now. 
Thank you. It's so nice that you say that really. I mean, I'm, I'm so touched because this really is my goal um, to make it so easy for folks. And uh, I, I've gone through the big, huge books and studied them because that's my passion is to really get deep and learn. I've done it a little bit through um, experimentation and testing and then going through the big books. As I started writing my first book, it was, it actually started through my website, which is called Garden Therapy. I started um, just an online space because I was feeling that loneliness, that desire to connect with other folks, especially folks my age, um, because there are so many, there were so many people who are gardening who are sort of seniors and retired. And, you know, I was younger and I wanted to sort of, I, this is pre-children for me. So I wanted to meet people my age and talk about gardening. And uh, so I started garden therapy. I started connecting with people all over the world about gardening. And I would show the pictures of the projects I was doing. And people said, those are great but how did you do it? So I would take pictures of the steps and write out all the steps and, and really found, you know, sort of, that's where I, I found my sweet spot, that passion of mine is to, to write out the DIY steps to do these things. So all of my books are, are step-by-step project books. Um, not all of them are specifically on gardening because I do have a really creative element as well. I have a lot on uh, natural skincare and so how to take the power of um, plants and turn them into beautiful soaps and lotions and gifts I even have a candle making book uh, that does the same sort of thing. Just really fun therapeutic projects that are easy to accomplish, look great, and sort of, you know, whenever you walk by them makes you feel that little splash of joy that you were able to do it. Um, but throughout the way, you know, I really got deep behind the scenes into writing about gardening. And I was asked by my publisher to write a book um, about herbalism and gardening together. So taking yeah potions and elixirs and concoctions that we would normally use as medicine uh, for herbalists, use them as med medicine for people, but use it as medicine for our garden. So how do we make willow water for rooting? Or how do we make a chamomile antifungal spray? Or how do we take comfrey um, and blend that into a herbal smoothie that helps to feed the garden? So taking those kinds of plants and uh, making them into things, how to make compost tea, how to make, you know, an aerated compost tea versus a compost dilution, all those sorts of things. I did that in my last book called Garden Alchemy. And so it's kind of like a recipe book for your garden. I, I thought with that book, it was going to be way out there and, and, and folks would go, you know, I don't know what she's talking about. This, this stuff seems a little bit strange for me, but as soon as the book launched, uh, people were like, yes, absolutely. The answers are in nature. Mm -hmm. And so it made sense. And because I had the science and the research background, I talked a lot about soil science. I break it down so that it makes sense. I kind of treat it like that DIY project. Here are the steps to get your thinking there. And here's why it works. And just look, mother nature is doing it all the time. So why aren't we following that path? Yeah. Um, people were so receptive to garden alchemy that uh, when it was, when that book came out, my publisher asked if I wanted to write another book with them and pitched an idea to me, which I didn't want to do. I said, okay. this is the book that I want to do. I want to take permaculture to the home gardener. I want to take these concepts that are big and meaty and sometimes difficult for people to digest and take it so that it's, we can make gardening less work, less effort, uh, more fun. The idea of a regenerative garden is that you can plant it, develop the systems, walk away for 10 years and come back and find it thriving. Mm -hmm. So that's what I want people to do is be able to have that space to, to enjoy that provides them with food, beauty, a place for entertaining, a place for relaxing, all without having to treat it like a chore that you have to, you know, get to on the weekends when you know, you just want to be out there enjoying it instead of heading out there and weeding and watering and pruning things back that feels, you know, could feel a little bit overwhelming. Yeah, that's something that has come up quite a lot on the podcast. But I think it has come up, the, the podcast is only going two years. So it's not a it's not a huge amount of time to get a, I suppose, a snapshot of people's relationship with gardening. But definitely, and it, and, and it launched just at the start of, of COVID as well. So there's probably a little bit of evolution there naturally. But there is definitely, I would say over the last 12 months, particularly 
uh, a real move back to a less manicured, more relaxed garden that works in harmony with nature as opposed to trying to, you know, fix a style and then keep it in that style and, and always pushing back, you know, whether that's mowing your grass or uh, mowing your lawn or pruning everything to manicure shapes. There's, there seems to be a big move towards not rewilding, but definitely a, a way more relaxed way of gardening. And I think it takes the pressure off the person and gives them that enjoyment that is there but they don't necessarily get to do it if it's always a chore, as you say. Yes, absolutely. And I love that you said rewilding, but I love that you also didn't sort of, you know, assume that what I'm talking about here is making our gardens look like a forest yeah. because that's, that's not the goal. I mean, I'm not talking about, and in the book, um, it, it's a very, very uh, forgiving book. It's meant to give you ideas and support you along the way without judgment at all. So it's mm -hmm. not one of those things that says, you know, we need to reduce our carbon footprint and we need to do everything organically and all of our plants need to be native. It says, here's the benefits of planting some native plants. Try and include a percentage in your garden, do what works for you. But of course you're still going to want to grow food that's not native to your area. You're gonna to want to grow flowers that are not native to your area. And if you can do that by learning enough about your garden so that they grow naturally, that you can create enough diversity that they're supported and that you, you find the ways to help them thrive, then you, you, you can set up a garden in a system that's just less maintenance, but also, you know, it's, it's somewhere between that wild and manicured. Mm -hmm. It's uh, a space that has diversity and beauty, but is, you know, sometimes I think of it as the difference between gardening and landscaping. You know, there's, when you see a landscape garden, you can see that this was, you know, designed by someone mm -hmm. to look a certain way. And gardeners are the people, they go out and they're like, oh, I fell in love with this flower. And so I bought it and I don't know where I'm going to put it in my garden but I got to put it in. And that's how we should be doing it. I mean, there's some joy and celebration that comes from, you know, every perennial division that we're given by a neighbor or, you know, the absolute ins insanity of some vegetable like a zucchini that grows so many of them that you cannot give away enough to all of your neighbors. Yeah. You know, so it, th some successes, some, you know, failures, all of it is just an evolution. And that should be, that should be the process of gardening rather than the one of consistently, you know, ripping out plants, planting new ones, bringing in new soil. Instead, find the ways to regenerate your own soil, to support mm -hmm. it, to allow those plants to reseed themselves if you like them and not if you don't. You know, that sort of regeneration with you playing the role of Mother Nature and choosing which goes in and which does not. Yeah. Um, <laughs> in, terms of, in terms of permaculture, um, what, as you said, permaculture is a very broad topic and, you know, there's a lot of deep science behind it. And yeah, some of the books, I have some of them here and they're, they're hundreds of pages of very technical and sometimes quite difficult to understand language. Uh, what are the principles of permaculture as you see it that can and probably should be employed in people's gardens, um, you know, that you relate to and the, that, you, that you talk about in this book? Well, I talk about the principles of regenerative gardening rather than permaculture because permaculture okay. has ethics and principles that, you know, like you said, are all sort of unique and, and have lots of depth to them, which are wonderful. I took those concepts and, and laid out six parts of a regenerative garden that I think are easily applied. Okay. And those are the six chapters in the book. So that is the first one is soil. Of course, we always start with the soil. Then there's water, water catchment storage and use. Then there is uh, plants. So how do we use plants in a regenerative garden? What can the plants teach us? Then I have, um, you know, and those are sort of your three most expected gardening um, topics or chapters or elements, mm -hmm. I would say, principles. The other three are climate. So um, I'll say this, most people think when they read the climate chapter or when they, they see the climate chapter before, prior to reading it, they think that it's about 
our changing climate, but instead it's about our ability to read and understand our climate, our microclimates, how we don't have a 30 year weather average anymore that we can depend on. And we need to be able to watch and learn from our own spaces and then uh, harness the energy from nature. So how do we protect from wind if we need to gather um, heat and hold it, extend our seasons uh, at the beginning, at the end of the year, you know, those sorts of things. How do we use energy to our best, um, our, our best uh, ability to, to, to help us with our gardens? Then the next is ethics. And that's really about reducing waste and using things the best that we can. So that's where you'll find a lot more of the composting information instead of ripping everything out of our garden and then tossing it away, allowing somebody else to compost it and then buying it back, which seems absolutely crazy to me, but how a lot of us do it. Um, and things that, you know, I, I, I talk a lot about one of those subjects that I, um, when I do my talks, uh, people have a lot of questions about how I do my chop and drop composting, which is simply to chop things um, that are healthy and disease free, uh, or I leave them in the garden and just let them fall where they may, just like the forest does. And it really creates a layer of mulch. It builds up the compost layer. It, it adds organic material. So things like just, you know, reducing waste. And then the final component is community. And I originally had called that one wildlife because it was about, you know, who, who spends time in our garden and, and, I, and who helps us with our gardens? Who are those little worker bees that are helping us with our pollination and, uh, you know, pest control and things like that. But I realized as I sort of thought through the book and the concepts and how it all came together that one of the real key components to a regenerative garden is how the garden space serves us as people, uh, our families, our friends, our neighbors, the people who pass by, those in our community. And so it's not just the, the living beings that aren't human that we support, you know, the, the critters and the insects, but also the people who we live in the neighborhood with and how our gardens can become this hub of supporting and beautifying our neighborhoods. Very good. Um, nice, nicely laid out. To, to go back to the first one, uh, which is soil. Um, it, it's a funny thing because it, it's at the start of the book and you would think it is the most obvious, uh, the most obvious and important section. And I don't know how it is in, in Canada. Maybe you guys are a little bit ahead of us in terms of our thoughts around soil but definitely as gardeners here in Ireland and I know in the UK the soil for a good many years was just the soil there was no big amount of thought put into it and the thought process was feed the plants feed the plants feed the plants and it has changed over the last couple of years to feed the soil and they'll look after the plants for us is that a new thing with yourselves in Canada, or is this something that has, you know, happened over the last number of years? And I often reference back, my grandparents used to have a fabulous vegetable garden in the center of a town. And I suppose they were doing, they were doing this no dig gardening. They were treating the soil with farmyard manure all the time. They didn't put a label on it, you know, so it wasn't no dig gardening or it wasn't, uh, they weren't feeding the soil. This is just what they did. And then for some reason, we seem to forget that. And it's only now in the last year or two, I think that people are coming back to see the importance of soil and that it really is the most important and first stage that you have to get right to make everything else easier as you go along. I, you know, I guess I'm a little desensitized to the whole thing because um, when I did my master gardeners program, you know, all those years ago, uh, I guess it was 13, 14 years ago. I remember the day that we did soil, we had soil scientists come in and talk to us. I was brimming with excitement. I just felt like I was jumping out of my seat after that. I mean, we talked, to, we had vegetable people and rose people come in and we talked about perennials and tree pruning, which is also really fun. But the soil day, I just, it just hit me. Soil science is such an exciting thing because there's this whole world going on beneath the surface that we we just don't know we just don't know about it so in the book i talk a little bit of in my intro of the soil chapter about how uh learning about 
the soil is kind of thinking about the kind of like thinking about the ocean. You know, we think about this grand expanse of ocean and that we don't really see beneath the surface. We know that there's creatures that live in there. We're aware of them. Some of them are quite large. And uh, we know that there's an ecosystem that exists in the oceans, but we don't fully understand it the way we understand sort of the above ground mm -hmm. um, uh, ecosystems. But with soil, it's the same thing. There is wildlife that lives in our soil, bacteria, fungi, um, all these different microorganisms and insects and uh, mammals that dig around and all these things come together to transform the organic matter that is in, that transform dirt into soil, essentially transform um, organic matter by digesting it, making nutrients available for plant roots to take up. So even if we are feeding, feeding, feeding our plants, um, you know, first of all, if we're doing it with synthetics, it's very, very, um, it, it's costly and it takes a lot of extra time. If we are allowing nature to do it for us, we're setting up the systems by adding this organic matter and then inviting those organisms in that soil wildlife to do the work for us while we sit back and sip tea. So, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I think, um, I, my brain has has gone to sort of the soil science excitement very early, but you're very right that people doing all this no dig uh, really get it. Um, and I'd love to share a little story about that. Yeah. When I when I moved into this home, I, so after my first house, I you know I had that for ten years, then I moved into this one, and it had a very beautifully landscaped yard with a lot of really expensive landscape plants in it. Uh, but it was very overgrown. The, the, the past owners were not taking care of those plants very well or the garden. They were busy doing other things. And so even though we had these really beautiful specimens of plants around the garden, they had a lot of disease. They were sickly. They were losing their leaves. Uh, they had a lot of pest problems. And I kind of looked at them and I thought, like, what is going on here? So I peeled back the layers of the soil and took a look underneath at what was going on. And it, as it turns out, when they did the renovation of the landscaping and the, whole, and the house space, they buried a lot of the construction material under the soil. So there was huge blocks of concrete soil, like rusty nails, boards of wood, like all this stuff under there. And the plants were just dying for anything that would give them some nutrition. So instead of replacing the plants, I took out those big chunks of concrete and sort of dug around in the soil, amended the soil, repaired it, gave it a better composition, gave it lots of organic matter, and then the plants just blossomed and thrived. So really, you can feed them, feed the plants, which is absolutely what you should be doing in the much more um, difficult, expensive way of buying synthetic fertilizers and dumping them on, or you can feed them in a more natural way by building your soil, adding amendments, and sort of you know, taking the long-term approach of building as everything grows. Yeah, for sure. And that's something that, again, as you talk to, uh, well, as I talk to, to, to gardeners over the last two years, it's something that the soil is coming to the fore more, but it's also the amount of people that have had, and I'll, I have firsthand experience that I'll tell you about in a second, but the amount of people that are, basically making gardens in very poor soil by just amending it with organic matter mostly. Um, and my own experience of it was I, I have an area of the garden. It's only a, a small area, but it's where there was some excavation work for the, the treatment system, the water treatment system for the house. And it was really poor soil. Now we have what we around here, it's, it's an old uh, coal mining area. So we have a real kind of yellow, uh, a real yellow kind of marley type clay in parts. There is some good clay up top, but on the bottom, this this marley stuff. Anyway, in this, gar in this corner, that's all it was, was, was marl. But for the last two years, I've been doing what you said, the, the, the chop and drop. I've been taking the lawn cuttings and just putting them on fresh about four or five times over the growing season. And it is incredible how much it has changed over two years. And I've spoke about it a good few times. So originally that was yellow, um, really poor clay, wouldn't grow anything. But now it's, it's gone black, it's full of earthworms, and it's really quality clay, quality soil. <clears throat> Excuse me.
excuse me. <coughs> excuse me. So yeah, it, it really works and basically any soil can be amended. Yeah, that's such an exciting story. And it's, you know, I, I, I hope that people can hear from both of our stories um, that there's an easier way and, and you know, it does take a little bit of time to let nature do its work, but trusting in that process, mm -hmm. it's, it's such a good one. Um, so in, in my garden alchemy book, one of the things I have, because I also have a soil chapter in that one, and this is sort of uh, your experimentation and learning about your soil. There's a bunch of different home tests that you can do to figure out your soil pH, your soil composition, so how much sand, silt, and clay you have, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and just sort of lets you know a little bit about your, your soil. So with the soil test to figure out what your you know, what your soil composition is, you, you know, take a bunch of soil, put it into a mason jar, shake it up with some water, let that settle. And then you can see the layers of sand, silt, and clay. Uh, and then you, you know, would look at it and say, okay, if I have a heavy clay soil or a heavy or quite a sandy soil, some people think that what you would do with a clay soil is add a bunch of sand to it because it's a mm -hmm. larger pot particle and clay is a much smaller particle. And we're trying to get sort of that loam in the middle, which is, you know, a balance of uh, all the different sizes of particles together. Mm -hmm. But if you add the, the larger particles of sand to clay together, you're essentially creating cement. You're getting, you're taking those small particles, filling them in with the larger particles, and then creating a solid block with no aeration or, or place for plant roots and place for, you know, that soil wildlife to live in there. So the answer to a high clay soil or a high sand soil is to add organic matter. So it's quite funny. We go through this, this whole, all these steps to get you to um, the place where you understand what your soil composition is. And then the answer is to add organic matter, no, what, no matter what your answer is. So you don't need to go through those steps unless you want to sort of, you know, take the time to learn about yeah, understand it. understand it a bit more. Yeah, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's definitely a worthwhile process. Uh, but at the end, the answer is the same. Add organic matter, continue to add it to your garden. And the more you do that, the more you know, the, the, the organisms will come in and they will, you know, chew on it and transform it into plant available nutrients. Yeah, for sure. Um, you mentioned, and I'm just going backwards for a second here, you mentioned um, using uh, or making a spray. I think you said with for fungal, for controlling fungus. Am I, yes. did, I did I hear that right? Yep, yep, I have that in my uh, Garden Alchemy book. Um, that's one of my concoctions and elixirs. So chamomile is a really strong antifungal. And if you make a chamomile tea, it's a very gentle antifungal as well. So if you get something like, do you get powdery mildew or those sorts yeah. of fungal? Yeah, or uh, dampening off, which is yeah. when you get the fungus on seedlings, you know, you're starting seedlings in your greenhouse. And if it gets a little bit too much moisture, mm -hmm. they get fuzzy on the stems and it can kill off all of your wonderful seedlings. Watering with a little chamomile tea uh, can really help to prevent the fungus growing on there. And then using the spray on anything that's getting powdery mildew early on in season, putting it in your watering. It's really, really effective as, a, as an antifungal that's very gentle and plant safe. Very good. Yeah. And I, I, I wasn't aware of that, but like powdery mildew is a big problem here, particularly on fruit. And yeah, damping off is, I suppose, a problem for everybody occasionally. So yeah, it's good to know that there's something that there's something there. And I didn't know chamomile was good for that. So yeah, uh, so grow lots of chamomile in the garden, especially around all those plants, too, because the natural um, you know, having the natural plants growing around as the, because we know that our fungal diseases are all spread by water, right? So mm -hmm. if, if you've got chamomile growing around things that typically get a lot of powdery mildew, then it, then when the water droplets hit it, hopefully they're not splashing up with, uh, the fungus still intact or it's helping to control it. Yep. You mentioned then as well, uh, you're using some plants and you're doing the chop and drop. And I've told you that I've done that. A I do that a little bit with, with just lawn clippings. But is there any particular ones that you find very good for chop and drop? I know comfrey is quite good. Anything else that you use? 
Yeah, comfrey is wonderful. Um, I, you know what? I try to chop everything. I mean, if I'm going to chop, I'll try to leave everything in, as you in know, situ. this. Yeah, I leave it in in its place. So, so if there's you know uh, flowers that have gone to seed, I leave those for the birds to eat. Mm -hmm. um, but when I do chop them back, so you know the new growth is coming and it's time for things to fall, I I try to drop chop and drop them right in place um a couple of things yes wild plants are really good as long as you remove the flower heads or ones that spread by rhizomes or roots making sure that you're not including those uh, anything that's got any disease or pests i don't leave in place so i make sure i remove those so anything that's sort of healthy and green can stay um leaves you know if they fall on the lawn or the sidewalk i'll move those away from the leaves or the sidewalk and put them into the garden bed so it's building up more and more on that top mm -hmm. of the soil and then the other thing you know think about where things don't naturally grow so if you have a water feature like a pond some pond plants can be really really invasive if they are put into waterways but if you put them into dry land gardens they act as a really great uh, fertilizer source um, or uh, like a nice mulch mm -hmm. and they won't become invasive so it's not like you're taking you know certain pond I know pond plants and uh, I like to grow plants in my water you know I have a wildlife pond and I have a couple of fountains and I grow some plants in there um, but if you were to toss those into the waterways then they could definitely clog up some of our natural water systems and we don't want to do that but putting them on the dry land is you know completely fine because they won't survive there they'll just ask, act as a really nice compost yeah. <laughs> um back to the book for a second so it's it's 80 practical projects and it takes it you take us through a lot of you know creating a wildlife pond composting there's a book hotel in it there's lots of bits and pieces um is there any you know is, what what are the, the big ones and it's divided up into the six chapters that we spoke about is there anything in it that's you know sort of different or unusual that you know that people should really watch out for well, I think there's the typical things that you'll find in permaculture that maybe home gardeners aren't as um, aware of and really practical ways to put them in place. So that's, you know, things like how to build guilds, which are um, growing plants together in mm -hmm. it, that support each other. So a really uh, common one that um, we that in North America, we talk about a lot. Seed companies have have also um, uh, mimic this even though it's an indigenous um, an indigenous gar gardening or farming style uh, which is do something called the three sisters no, and yeah. that's yeah yes okay so you know about the three sisters um, and that's where we plant corn bean and squash together because they all work in a little they create their own little ecosystem you know the the corn will grow up tall and the beans will use that as a um, as a trellis the pole beans will grow up it and and they will fertilize the soil uh, or sorry add nitrogen to the soil for those really heavy feeders the squash and the corn and then the squash grows up big leaves that keeps the roots of the corn cool and you know all of it sort of works together giving you a lot of food production a very small um, footprint. Well, a guild is kind of like that. There's, um, you know, Mexican systems called milpas, which are sort of that sort of same concept, but even bigger, where whole farms are built on it, and they're growing maybe 12 different kinds of crops all together at the same okay. time, and then they burn the rows, and then they plant them all again. So a guild is really just the concept, and I've got some guild recipes, you know, ones that surround an apple tree, and then different herbs and things that you can plant around them. So you get this really productive space. Some of them are for food, some of them are for, um, you know, like maybe medicines, but some of them are maybe like echinacea and chamomile and those things that are sort of healing herbs for us. Uh, other ones just for beauty or for pollinators. Um, and it gives you a lot in a small space. And I think another example of that would be a food forest. So we hear a lot about growing food in a food forest and all the different layers, but I broke down all seven layers so that you can see um, you know, how we can grow food from the top of the overstory trees, which, you know, might produce nuts that are, you know, far too high and far too many for us to harvest, but then support some of the wildlife and we'll still get some food production for it. Understory brambles, um, uh, smaller fruit trees, uh, brambles that create a, a protective space to keep some wildlife out or allow nesting spaces for others. Um, 
you know, going down to ground level plants where you've got perennial food plants, ground covers like maybe strawberries that, you know, you can pick in those areas and even mushrooms growing in the same area or epiphytic plants. Um, in our forest here, we have usnea, which is uh, a wonderful um, medicine for your lungs. And so, and that grows naturally on some of our trees. And so there's all sorts of different things that we can add to our food forest, which again, gives us production in a very, very small space. So I'd say those are the permaculture concepts, but then there's a more, the more unique component um, of the community section that comes at the end of the book, which I think is, is a real highlight of this book um, because it takes this, it takes a lot of those projects that uh, we would normally put in our gardens and allows us to reach out into our communities and become sort of, uh, you know, good citizens of the earth, but also welcoming and friendly spaces for our uh, building connections with our other humans. Yeah, the, the, as I said, the, the concepts and the, the way it's put together are brilliant and uh, it's it's very, very practical. And I, th I like, I use a lot of gardening books. Uh, I've said this before as well, when it comes to almost any question that I might have, I'll typically go to Google and just quickly Google it. But when it comes to gardening, I always prefer to pick up a book and and flick to it. I don't know, and I don't know why that is, but I always do. Uh, and it is a, a really nice book. And I think people will find a lot from it. Um, maybe you'll tell people where they can find the book and where they can where they can check you out. I know you're on Instagram and you have a website. So maybe tell us about all those places. Yes, absolutely. So my, you can Google Stephanie Rose Gardening uh, or Garden Therapy is my website. It's gardentherapy.ca because I'm in Canada. But generally, if you Google anything, Garden Therapy, Stephanie Rose Gardening, um, those sorts of things, I come up. There's another Stephanie Rose author out there. And uh, that's not me. I am the one that does the gardening <laughs> books. So just in case you're out there having a look on Google, um, have fun finding that other one. <laughs> She's got some interesting books too. Um, so yeah, you can find me. I'm at Garden Therapy on Instagram, Facebook, Pinterest, Twitter, all those places. Uh, again, that's my healing journey that brought me to this place of gardening. And my book can be found at all major bookstores throughout the UK um, and uh, Canada, US, Australia, all English speaking countries. Um, so definitely online at major bookstores. So I, I'm guessing um, Amazon and I'm not sure what other bookstores you have. But yeah, you, people, people will find it anyway. And it really is. It's a, it's a lovely book. Uh, really well put together and yeah as it says uh, 80 practical principles or projects so it's it's very practical and quite a lot in it but easily digestible I think so yeah really well done on that um, it's been an interesting chat we've gone uh, across <laughs> a lot of topics um, very broad range considering that if I if I remember rightly you said you started this journey in 2006 so you have definitely uh, built up a lot of knowledge over that time and uh, as I say a really interesting chat and we covered lots of interesting topics and the book definitely is worth checking out so Stephanie thank you very very much for coming on Master My Garden podcast oh thank you so much John it's been my absolute pleasure and I really hope that we can do this again sometime soon yeah for sure and the best of luck with the book thank you Stephanie thanks take care bye okay we're stopped recording there now